a few extra minutes. We said the presentation would start shortly after six and people are still streaming into the room. Give them a little bit of time to get settled, grab some coffee, a little cookie. If you guys haven't noticed, coffee, cookie, tea over on the table, please go grab it or else we have to take it to City Hall tomorrow and everyone gets to eat stale cookies. So please go and finish them up tonight. So we'll get started in uh, about four or five minutes and go over a brief presentation and then you guys can ask a bunch of questions. And to add on to that, this is being live streamed tonight. So just so you're aware, this is being live streamed.
All right, if everyone can just trickle in, we're um, past that couple minutes past six, and we'd like to get rolling. Um, so just as I'm waiting for the presentation to go up on the screen, I'm just going to um, repeat that, oh, amazing, uh, this is being live streamed tonight, so just so you're aware, this is being live streamed, um, and everything that is being done today will be on public record, and you can watch it again if you really feel like it, the hot topic up on the, our YouTube channel. So before we get started, um, I would like to acknowledge and honor the four nations on whose lands we are currently gathering the Sinaiaks, the Tahana, the Shukwetmik, and the Silks. Um, this is just a very uh, small land acknowledgement and a small road forward in the path to reconciliation. And just straight up, our, our city has a long way to go on that, but this is just a small tip in the bucket. To get into our next bigger topic. Ooh. Ooh, thank you, Paul. Um, why we're all here tonight. We're here to talk about short-term rentals. Um, and uh, to do that today, up at the front, um, I'm here with my amazing team. I've got Jennifer Headley over there at the door. Um, thank you so much, Jen. Um, we got Steve Black, he's our director. Um, I've got Shannon Hogan right here, uh, Kenny Gibbs, Paul Simon, and the man behind the curtain tonight is Jay Morrison, and me, myself, and I, my name is Adrian Comars. Um, perfect. So tonight, this is kind of what's going to be happening for our presentation. It's a quick introduction, which I just did. Um, we're going to go over the rules of engagement for this presentation here tonight. Um, we're going to go over what the current rules are for short-term rentals. Um, we're going to go over business lic licensing and the processing of business licensing. Um, we're going to go over what accompanies that, the enforcement of the business licensing. We're going to talk about Bill 35, the provincial legislation changes that were brought into Royal Assent on October 26, 2023. Um, and then afterwards, we're going to do some questions and answers. Uh, there's an open mic, which we will turn on, which you can come up and you can discuss there. Or you can do it discreetly through the app that we have, uh, Slido. At the moment, prior to even starting this discussion, we had over 64 questions on that app. So we might go into not having enough time tonight to discuss them all, but as we have in previous engagement sessions, if we don't have the time to uh, address them here right now tonight, we will be putting them, typing them all up and addressing them later via um, some sort of online platform. Uh, to be figured out where that's gonna go, but we can definitely communicate that out because we have a wonderful communications officer now. Hello, Francesca. Um, our rules of engagement here for tonight. We're just gonna be respectful. We're gonna be respectful for everyone. We're all human, we all make mistakes, and uh, we all just need to acknowledge that. We're gonna be mindful of time so that anyone that would like to participate can participate. We're gonna focus on the future moving forward versus getting incredibly stuck in the past. We're gonna to try to stay on task as much as possible. Uh, we're here to talk. We're here to talk specifically about short-term rentals. We're gonna be open-minded to listening to others' perspectives and open-minded to learning. And remember that regulating short-term rentals, it's an incredibly complex, very not simple. It's, it's almost like a meta problem, and we are right in the middle of it right here, right now. So again, this is a highly complex problem. It's not very simple. And to get into the complexity of this, my colleague, Paul Simon, he's going to actually talk about what our current rules and regulations are for short-term rental. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. Great to see a good turnout here. I just want to acknowledge we have a few council members here. We have the mayor here. We have our chief administrative officer, Evan Parliament here. So you really do have a lot of folks from the city that do work in City Hall and throughout uh, the community that do care about this and do want to come and show up so that we can answer questions from the public. So as Ms. Comar has indicated, I'm going to give a general overview of what our existing short-term rental regulations are within the city. 
They've evolved over the last 15 years or so, and it does uh, require some nuance to understand them throughout the community, so we're going to do our best to explain it right now. So within residential buildings, the city currently allows for both short-term rentals as well as bed and breakfast. What's the difference between the two? Well, short-term rental refers to renting out an entire dwelling unit. Could be a secondary suite, could be a condo unit, could be a full single family dwelling on a short-term basis that's less than 30 days. Whereas a bed and breakfast, think of it as your single family home that you're renting out rooms within your single family home. Those rooms are not a separate dwelling unit, it's rooms within your primary residence, which is your single family dwelling. Bed and breakfast is permitted within single family dwellings within all of our standard residential zones. So I know not everyone's so familiar with our zoning, but your standard R1s, R2s, single family homes, you're allowed to do a B&B &B in all of those standard zones. Short term rental gets a little bit more complicated. And in order to run a short term rental within the city of Revelstoke, you're required to have appropriate zoning for the use short term rental specifically. So one of the first questions is, where do we allow what we refer to as whole home short term rentals within a single detached dwelling? So throughout the 2010s, the city approved numerous what we refer to as spot zoning applications. So if anyone has read through our zoning bylaw and some of you have been in the city for a little bit, might remember those at times contentious public hearings for someone going to a V property, R1V, R2V, so that you could allow short-term rental as a whole home rental on a specific property within the city. And so within these zones, single detached dwellings are permitted to operate as a whole home rental. So you don't need to live on site in order to operate a short-term rental. You just need 24 seven property management services. In April, 2022, as part of short-term rental regulatory updates, the city expanded this allowance to two areas in the city. One of the areas being properties that are zoned C1, which is the downtown area. So within our downtown area, we have some historic single family residences, and those are permitted to be operated as whole home short-term rentals with 24 seven property management services. Same thing within what we refer to as our C6 area, which is Victoria Road Commercial, old remnants of commercial that has evolved over time along Victoria Road. There's still some single family residences there and those are permitted to be operated as whole home rentals. So that added in addition to the 32 spot zones that we had, another 21 single family dwellings that are eligible to be used as short term rental. So next, again, we're talking whole home rentals here where you don't need to live on site in order to operate a short term rental. Where do we allow it in what we call multi unit dwellings? So that could be things like row houses, otherwise known as townhomes, apartment buildings, condos, where do we allow that in the city? So again, throughout the 2010s, the city approved six comprehensive development zones. And you can think comprehensive development zones as site specific zones that are unique compared to our standard zones that are within the zoning bylaw. And within those comprehensive development zones, you can see they're scattered throughout the community here. We have six of them. We have two of them that are out on the highway. So where the Ramada and the Marriott is, some of the, if there's residential buildings built there, they're permitted to be used as short-term rental, as whole home rentals. On Townley Street, we got eight row houses that were successfully rezoned to a comprehensive development zone where those can again be used as whole home rentals. Powerhouse area, we got about 45 units there where it's a mixed use building with commercial or industrial on the main floor, residential above. Those can be used as short-term rentals. And then lastly, McKenzie Village, condos that can be used as whole home rentals, as well as the resort, where the resort is entitled to short-term rentals in accordance with their master development agreement and their zoning. So some of these zones, they're not fully built out. And trying to ascertain exactly how many units could potentially be accommodated at full build out is challenging within a few of these zones because the zones aren't specific enough to dictate the exact number of units. So that's planner lingo for there's not enough regulations within the zone to exactly know how many units are gonna be built. So staff estimate between 1,000 and 3,500 units could be accommodated amongst these six CD zones. So quite a substantial amount of short-term rentals within the community are already zoned. Of that, about 506 are currently built out. So that would be between the resort, McKenzie Village, the powerhouse CD zone, Townley Street, et cetera. And then lastly, and some people aren't aware of this, the city already does have a principal residence requirement for some short-term rentals within the community that are zoned a certain way. So in 2022, again, as part of the city's short-term rental regulatory review, 
There were two areas in the city that were expanded short-term rental allowances with a principal residency requirement. So this included the C2 zone, which is the downtown fringe zone. So it includes properties that are in vicinity to the downtown, but not quite within central Revelstoke, the historic area where it's purely residential. Uh, in this zone, as well as, I should mention, 59 properties that are adjacent to Hay Road, kind of sandwiched between Mackenzie Village and the resort. Within this zone, you're allowed to operate a short-term rental as long as you have what we refer to as permanent resident on-site operator. So what does that mean? In a nutshell, if you're living in this zone, you live in your suite, you can rent out the above unit as a whole home rental while you're living in the suite and you're the operator of that short-term rental. The neighbor has a concern, they can come and chat with you. Conversely, you can also live in your primary dwelling unit while you're renting out your suite as a short-term rental. So this amounts to about 101 additional properties that are eligible to be used for short-term rental. So you can see the current regulatory framework, it's evolved over the last 15 years. It's not all that simple. And you can also think too, within the planning group, I think I'm the longest serving planner the city's had for some time, and I'm at just over four years. So over, which is excellent, yes. And we have, and we have an excellent team here. And you know, that goes across the board. And it's really nice to see the positive trajectory that you know, the, the city's on. And, but what does that mean? You got 15 years of these rules being implemented and interpreted and applied differently and at times inconsistently, which can cause confusion. So the end result of all this, throughout the 2010s and into the 2020s, a whole mishmash of rules that have come into place that we've tried to clean up as best we can. And the end result, we got 53 single family dwellings that are eligible to be used as whole home rentals, 24 seven property management services. Remember those are the spot zones as well as uh, properties within the downtown and Victoria Road commercial district. We got about 506 multi-unit dwellings that are permitted to be used as whole home rentals again. And then 101 single detached dwellings that can be used as a short term rental with that principal residency requirement and where that permanent resident is the operator to deal with any on-site issues. So in total, we got about 3,800 dwelling units in the city. You can see about 17.5% of all dwelling units in the city are eligible to be used as short-term rental. So it's a pretty substantial amount. In 2022, because we have a bunch of properties that are appropriately zoned for short-term rental, council adopted a policy that says no more support. We're not gonna support any more rezoning for new short-term rentals within the community because we already have enough land that's zoned for it. The only exception to this is Thomas Brook, which is immediately across from the resort. There's allowances for doing things like, you know, some small lodges, maybe up to eight units to complement their proximity to the resort. They have a, a land use designation under our official community plan that supports some short-term rental that we call the resort fringe land use designation. And I saw there were some questions about that. So from there, if you're zoned appropriately for a short-term rental, what's your next steps? You would apply for a business license and Ms. Hogan is gonna walk you through what that business licensing process looks like at the city. All right, so in order to operate a short-term rental or a bed and breakfast in the city, an approved business license is required. Operating or advertising your business without an approved business license is in contravention of the business licensing bylaw and may lead to enforcement action. So there are two main fees associated with a business license application. So that's the intake fee and the annual business license fee. For a short-term rental, uh, the annual fee is $500 plus $250 per licensed bedroom. And that's due every January. The intake fee is $50 and that's only required when submitting a business license application. So all business license applications are submitted to development services and reviewed by planning staff to ensure compliance with all applicable bylaws. So that includes the zoning bylaw and the business licensing bylaw. In our reviews, staff are making sure that all the required documents are included. So this means checking for contact information for a 24 seven on-site operator, um, it, whether or not fire business license and business license inspections are needed, um, if parking meets the zoning requirements, and if these good neighbor agreement has been signed. Uh, additionally, in some cases, you may be required to show proof of residency, and this is because all B&B operators and short-term rental operators, depending on zoning, are required to be, to have permanent on-site residents. Uh, so I'll now pass it over to Kenny, who's gonna speak to uh, enforcement. Hi there, everybody. Um, so 
As far as for the enforcement side of things, our city, our bylaw officers pursue both proactive and reactive enforcement in accordance with our council approved by, uh, bylaw enforcement policy. So with that, I do want to make clear our bylaw officers are not just dedicated to short term rentals. They do have quite a few other aspects that do fall within their scope. Uh, but we do also utilize software solutions to help monitor the short term rentals. We use a software called currently called host compliance. It uh, I'll be honest, it is not perfect, but it does provide us some uh, fair amount of relevant data that does help with the enforcement of short-term rentals. Uh, those violations uh, for zoning and business licensing requirements, they are subject to fines up to currently $1,000 per offense per day under our municipal ticketing bylaw. We also did recently adopt a adjudication bylaw, which is a little bit of a different ticketing system as well. And the maximum fine under that is $500 per offense per day. Uh, with that, Part of the reason why we did implement that was in hopes to try to help deal with some of these short term rentals as it can be quite challenging to enforce using municipal ticketing system uh, through uh, out of town owners. Some, uh, it, it, the there's quite a few challenges associated with the municipal ticketing and servicing requirements. So with that, I'll pass it back over to Paul here to finish off on Bill 35 and I'm sure we're going to be coming back right around again to talk some more about this. So pass it back over to Paul. And if we didn't mention it already, <clears throat> Kenny is our manager of building and bylaw currently. So any enforcement questions you have, which are usually the hardest ones, they'll be going right to him after. And we're very lucky to have him and very happy to have him. And he's doing an excellent job here at the city. So probably the main reason why most people have come out tonight is to understand what is Bill 35. Province is changing legislation. They introduced about 10 years worth of legislation within six weeks which makes it really, really challenging to keep up with and what it ultimately means and how it works with the existing regulatory framework that we already went over. And it does get a little bit complicated, to be honest. So we're gonna do our best to keep it as simple as possible and answer any questions you guys have today about it. So Bill 35, really boring name for it, but the real name for it is the Short-Term Rental Accommodation Act. The province uh, adopted this, gave it royal assent on October 26. And what are some of the key changes that are automatically applicable to Revelstoke. So we don't have to do anything. This is automatically applicable to Revelstoke as the province rules out this legislation through 2024. And a little bit later, we'll get into what that timeline looks like. So one of the changes right away that uh, came into effect, I believe on December 6. So we're able to increase offenses, the ones that Kenny was referencing under our municipal ticketing information bylaw. Instead of $1,000 per offense per day, it can go up to $3,000 per offense per day, and we will be taking advantage of that to ensure that we have the ability to impose stiff fines, not only on illegal short-term rental operations, but anyone who's operating illegally contrary to city bylaws. The province is going to create a provincial registration platform where all short-term rentals, all B&B operators, anyone who's doing anything short-term must register, and that data will be shared with local government. Mr. Gibbs had alluded to some of the challenges we have with host compliance. Just knowing where these are located is challenging to ascertain. And that's why we have to buy software to tell us where a lot of these properties are located and it's not foolproof. So this registration platform will be really helpful in actually giving us the information of where all the short-term rentals in the community are actually located at their permanent address. Host platforms that are advertising without a valid business license will be required to remove the listing. This is key. And we're working through what that process ultimately looks like, the delisting process with the province. I will note that, I know sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but Revelstoke is actually quite far ahead in this. And the city staff have been working really closely with provincial counterparts to actually help build that software and give information that will be really valuable, not only for Revelstoke, but other communities that are struggling with enforcing short-term rental regulations right now. Um, some municipalities don't even have a business licensing process in place for it, so this won't apply to them. It will apply to us, which is excellent. Uh, and lastly, the protections for, again, boring planner lingo, lawful non-conforming properties. I don't like this other term, but it's the better understood term of grandfathered. Uh, they will no longer apply. So what this means is, let's say you were operating a short-term rental 20 years ago. Back then the city said, yeah, we'll approve it. It's an accessory use, or we'll call it a motel or whatever it is. Then the city changes the regulations that you are no longer allowed to operate that short-term rental. Well, is that really fair for that operator? They were legal, they didn't do anything, they haven't changed their operation, and then the city comes in and changes the rules and says, well, now these new rules apply to you. 
So historically, all these properties, all these uses have been protected under these lawful non-conforming clauses. So as long as you don't change anything, as long as you don't cease your operation, you can continue to operate contrary to city bylaws as long as you were legal when you started. That is changing now. The province has introduced in the legislation that will be effective in May 2024, any protections for grandfathered properties will be removed. So you will no longer be able to operate if you fall within that. Luckily within Revelstoke, we don't have too many of those. We really haven't come across too many in our experience at the city. But the big question becomes, if we change our regulations to create properties that are now no longer in compliance, what does that look like? Because they would no longer be protected as grandfathered properties. So we have to think about this really carefully. Now, the biggest thing that was introduced with the legislation that is not applicable to Revelstoke unless via council resolution, we decide to opt in as a community, a principal residence requirement. So what does this principal residence requirement look like? Because from what we've seen, and it's a huge piece of why council was really keen to see staff host a public information session is because there is a lot of misinformation about this. So let's go through this a little bit more in detail. So the principal residence requirement means if the city decided to opt in, no short-term rental unless it is your principal residence. And how is that defined under the provincial legislation? The place where you spend the majority of your time. You have two houses, you live for one in seven months, and the other one for five months. The one you live in for seven months, you would then be able to short-term rent for the five months that you're not there. That's how it would work under the legislation. We can use this if we opted in as a floor for our local regulations. However, we can build more strict regulations on top of it, but we cannot build more lenient regulations. For instance, we couldn't say, let's opt in, but you know what, this one part of the city, we still want to allow whole home rentals there, let's keep them there. We can't do that. The principal residency rule is all or nothing. Bill 35 also defines short-term rental as anything 90 days or less, where we define it as 30 days or less. So that's just another little nuance to it that we'd have to reconcile with our existing bylaws if the city did decide to opt in. And then one of the other really important pieces is under Bill 35, if the city opted in, we would automatically be allowing short-term rentals when it's your principal residence throughout the entire community and not just one, two short-term rentals. So you would be able to, let's say you have a house with a suite and not currently permitted under zoning, but it will be in the future and a carriage suite on your property or a garden suite or a mother-in-law suite, whatever you want to call it. You would be able to live in your house and then rent out the other two pieces on your property. So if we opt in, that happens right away. So we would have to think really carefully if we opted in, we'd have to consider how do we then tweak our existing zoning rules if we don't want to expand short-term rentals with that rule throughout the whole community. So again, using it as the floor to build our regulations, we would then have to start imposing more and more strict regulations. And the reason why we spent so much time going over our existing regulatory framework is because we'd have to start dismantling that. And what that looks like starts to get really complex really quickly if we opt into this requirement. So we got to be really thoughtful about it. Um, so we'd have to think about, you know, how do we restrict the location of where short-term rentals are permitted if the provincial legislation as the floor allows it everywhere? We have to think about, do we want to restrict the total number of short-term rentals or the location of that short-term rental if we opted in? One of the things that's important to note is because we have the Revelstoke Mountain Resort that's predominantly within city boundaries, a portion of it does fall within Crown land, but a lot of it, and especially where the development is occurring, is within private property within city boundaries. Resort lands that are subject to a master development agreement with the province would be exempt from the principal residency requirement. So if we did opt in, that would not apply to lands at Revelstoke Mountain Resort. Uh, some other thing that's important to note is the timeline for this. If we wanted to opt in for this year, we have to make that decision by February 29th. So coming up really, really quickly. And just to give you guys an idea, yes, the bill got royal assent on October 26, but all these details that we're explaining today, we didn't understand these until the end of December working with our provincial counterparts. So you can see how it's a very, very rushed, condensed timeline for us to make all the changes necessary to really thoughtfully consider and do proper public engagement to determine whether or not opting into this principal residence rule is in the interest of this community. So for the first year, opt in by February 29th with the permanent residency requirement in effect by May 1st. And for future years, because you can opt in or opt out every single year, which adds another layer of complexity to this, uh, you'd have to opt in by March 31st every year for the requirement to take effect by November 1st. 
Some other little nuanced pieces of information with the legislation is condo hotels, stratified hotels with a rental pool, are exempt from the principal residency requirement if the city opts in. First question I have as a planner is what's the difference between a stratified condo hotel, so where all the individual units have their own title and you can sell an individual unit separately, what's the difference between that and a condo building where you can sell the unit separately? Some people say the taxes, well BC assessment doesn't necessarily look at it that way. So again, another layer of complexity if we opt in. Uh, and just lastly, condo hotels, bed and breakfast. You know, if you're operating one, you will have to register with the, uh, the province and their provincial registry. So a timeline for this, again, October 26, that's when it got royal assent, and December 7th is when we can now pass bylaws to increase our fines. February 29th, again, that is our deadline for opting in if we want to opt in by this year. May 1st, that's when the principal residency requirement would come into place. Throughout the summer 2024, we're gonna be working with the province and that's when data sharing and enabling provincial support for local governments or platforms to remove listings without a valid business license will be detailed. And we saw there were some questions on Slido about how that process is going to unfold. We don't know yet. And that's what we're working with the province on. It, it, there's a lot of nuance and detail to it. So we're continuing to work with them through that. And then late 2024 is when they think that they're actually gonna have the full launch of the provincial registry and have that delisting process fully flushed out. So still a good bit of work to do on the provincial side as they are implementing this legislation through 2024. So next steps. Some of you may or may not know, a report was brought forward to council on January 9th. Staff brought forward a report and recommended to council because of how condensed this timeline was that we defer a discussion on amending our short-term rental regulations and really considering to opt into this principal residence requirement until October of this year, where we can be a bit more thoughtful. We get through a few projects that are on the go and we'll get into details on why this recommendation was made to council and why it was ultimately successful. So in 2024, there's a lot happening within the planning group. One of the most key projects that we have underway right now is our comprehensive rewrite of the zoning bylaw. Did some minor updates back in 2022 but you guys are working with a zoning bylaw here from 1984. And I know that that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but what it actually looks like for addressing things like housing and what people can do on their properties to suit their needs, it's monumental. And the fact that it hasn't been properly updated since 1984 is a major issue. This has to get done. It is so critical to addressing the housing challenges that we have in Revelstoke. We need a proper functioning zoning bylaw. And this is long overdue. Well before I came here in December 2019, it has been a project that has been underway and it hasn't been successful. So we need to get this through, we need to get it done, and it will be the biggest thing we can do to address housing in this town. Another piece is the province also introduced another piece of legislation, of course, Bill 44. I'm not gonna go into super high level detail about it tonight, but just in a nutshell, we have to allow four units on every single lot within the city that's residentially zoned, that only allows for single family or two unit dwellings, a duplex right now, and we gotta do that by June 30th. So that's another piece that was not foreseen as being required for staff time to actually accommodate that. So we have to do that by June 30th of this year. And that's a requirement by the province. There's no way around it, no ifs, ands, or buts. We have to get that done. Updating a regulatory framework for short-term rentals, it's not currently budgeted. It's gonna take some time, it's gonna take some money, and it's gonna take some outside expertise to actually do it properly. What is the impact of opting in on this town? What's the impact on visitation gonna be? What does that look like for our downtown core? What does that look like for other businesses? We have cleaners in this community that rely on short-term rentals. We have furniture companies, we have hot tub service providers. The impacts of this could be substantial and we don't wanna make a decision without fully understanding at least at some level what those impacts are. And that's gonna take doing a proper economic analysis and doing that, preparing zoning amendments and doing proper public engagement so the community can actually provide feedback from varying perspectives that can be incorporated into these new rules Doing all that by February 29th, to be completely honest, isn't feasible, and there'd be no way that planning staff would be recommending that to council. That is way too condensed and way too confusing with the projects that are on the go right now too. And we don't wanna burn out the community with engagement fatigue and it would feel rushed because it is rushed. And that's not the proper way to go about this for a decision this big. Decision to opt into the principal residence requirement can be done on an annual basis. So again, rushing to do it this year doesn't make a lot of sense because there's so many unanswered questions that we have. And these details have been rolled out by the province between October and January now. So it's a really tight timeline again to try and get it in. Through 2024, we're gonna see more enforcement support for local, uh, local government. Let's work with our existing regulations and keep enforcing them really, really well so we're operating from a really good baseline of compliance with our existing rules. And then lastly, we did just do an update in 2022 and those rules are quite prescriptive and we have really detailed policies that say, we're not gonna support any more rezoning applications for short-term rental. 
So it's not like these rules haven't been looked at for two decades and it's long overdue and it's a huge priority. We did just update them in 2022. So let's keep working with them and let's use these new tools from the province to further enforce our existing framework. So that's more than enough of all of us talking, although we're gonna talk more with the questions. So again, there's two ways you guys can ask questions. For those that are brave enough, come up to the mic. And if you have questions and you wanna share a little bit of your perspective, that's fine. Do just try and be mindful of time. Part of the purpose of today was making sure that people are given the factual information about what this legislation means, what our current rules are, and how they mesh and the complexities associated with it, but also so that the community can start to see that this is an issue that has so many different viewpoints. Some people are no short-term rentals in the community at all, and some people are, it's my property, let me do what I want with it. We're gonna have to land somewhere in the middle on this. That's how these issues usually end up working out. And it's important to remember that not everyone shares the same perspective. So keep an open mind. Let's hear what others have to say. And let's try and remember that we're trying to get something in place that represents the public interest for the community moving forward into the future. So with that, there's some questions on Slido. We're gonna be answering from the mic here. And we can start with the Mr. Tobin at the front. How's it going? Hi, thanks. So um, I'm going to try to keep this brief as I can and not be cynical, but I heard you describing B&Bs. And you already know that there are B&Bs that are not being run as B&Bs, yet they have licenses. For example, the owner lives in Toronto. That's for the house that's right beside me. And so I don't know how many times it takes the RCMP to come to quell boorish behavior, whether it be racing a snow bike around the neighborhood or dragging a, a chip truck through everyone's front lawn and knocking down street signs. That involved the police chase. So that property, ironically enough, is run by a licensed property manager. Revelstoke Property Services. And you guys know about it. And this year we had someone urinating, walking across in the snow from their property onto my property to urinate. And was that in October or November? I guess it was November because we didn't have any snow in October. I'm still waiting for some feedback. I don't know why a B&B &B is allowed to be run by someone that lives in Toronto that doesn't live in that house. That, that in itself is contrary to the, to the bylaw. At the same time, there's a, there's, a, there's a suite, a legal suite. So my impression of the bylaw is that you can have a B&B &B or you can have uh, a suite, either or, not both. This prop, so carrying on a bit. So what's upsetting to me about this is, my wife and I bought a lot here in 2012. In 2010, I was, a paying, I was paying attention to the dialogue. We built our house, we started it in 2015, we moved into it in 2016. And you talked about the contentious $1,800 price for admission for an application to a public hearing. And inevitably, when that applicant was refused a license, they opened anyway with the city's full knowledge and nothing was done. So here we are, February, that was 2016, 2017. So here we are, February 6th, 2024. You're already saying tonight that you can't make February 29th. You're saying maybe sometime in October 2024, you're saying, but how do we start to believe you? How, when, and this is what I don't understand. You, you know someone has a, an illegal property, and it's not just illegal, it's obnoxious, it's boorish, it's dangerous. Last year on, on our street, we had Two families that went through the application process in 2017 on the very same street, but in slightly different locations, 
Both those, fa both those families were turned down unanimously. They opened up illegal vacation rentals. In, in, and by the way, in homes with septic systems that were designed for eight people, one house advertised room for 16. So th there, there's a whole pile of stuff going on. And, and so, one, when do we start believing you? Like, could, could, the latest incident, the, the urination on my property, you and you and a couple of others knew about it and did nothing. Got, I, we didn't hear anything back. And at that property now is a full-time rental and, and two short-term rentals. Alberta, Alberta, and then the long-term tenant. Mr. Tobin, okay, so I just want to, again, reminding everyone of the ground rules. We're not here to talk about the history. We're not here to talk about the past. We want to move forward. Tonight's purpose is to provide proper information. So if there's, I just, use. sir, if, I sorry. just, I just want to note, if anyone has any specific issues with an individual property, we have our manager of building and bylaw. We will set up a meeting, come in, talk with us, meet with us. We will go over the details and also note too, one of the key pieces we said in the presentation, there has been historic licenses that have been issued based on varying interpretations of the zoning bylaw over the last 15 years. Is it appropriate for staff to then go unilaterally revoke those licenses or to carry on the consistent interpretation of what was made at the time? So that's how we've been operating. And if there's specific issues about one individual property, we encourage you just so we can be respectful of everyone's time tonight to set up a meeting. I will reach out to you and we will set up a meeting for the three of us to sit down and so discuss this. Just to make the point though, there is a licensed property management company in this town that is probably the largest single enabler of illegal property rentals. Sir, sir again, I'm going to refer to our rules of engagement. We are not here to slander individual companies. We are not here to be disrespectful. It is very important that we are having a constructive, respectful conversation. So I'm just so confused I, I, by your I, definition. I, and sir, we, we need to be respectful of everyone's time. I will reach out to you. We will have a meeting with yourself, me, and Kenny. Brian, I'm going to um, ask you to meet with me afterwards. Um, we're not trying to be disrespectful to your questions or concerns, but this isn't the venue tonight for that. So please, afterwards, I can talk to you about some of your questions that you have that I've also talked to staff about specific to this property. We're not ignoring it, but in respect for everyone else here, we want to talk about Bill 35, and we want to talk about reaching consensus. So I, I hear you, but this is not the venue. Right, but what I'm questioning is you have to tell the truth. And when you say, when you define a use, I mean, what's the purpose of it? What's the purpose I, of having a meeting if, if, I can, if I can identify No, you've identified it. You've identified it. You've come to the, you've come to the mic. Years. I understand that. And, we, and we've been, I've been following this now for almost two years with you. Just give me that opportunity, please. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to some of the questions on Slido app now. So the first one, curious what the implications are for existing and future Mackenzie Village units. So if the city did opt into the principal residency requirement, then those units would be required to be operated by a principal resident. And again, what does that look like? Are we going to build on that principal residency requirement with more strict regulations? You know, the, again, the province defines it as the place you spend the majority of your time and then you can short term run it for the rest. Do we want that to be the case? Our principal residency rule right now requires you to be a permanent resident on-site operator for properties that are zoned that way. Do we want to, again, continue to build on that? So you would not be able to operate it as an absentee owner, essentially, if we opted in. Hello. Um, in the map that you, you showed about um, uh, zoning uh, around RMR, the streets for Stoke Living are represented. So is it yellow, red, or not? Thank you. Good question. Um, so Stoke Living, yeah, when that map was done, the roads weren't installed yet, so that's why they're not shown. Stoke Living has a comprehensive development zone where short-term rental is not permitted within that zone. 
So you can only reside there for long-term residential purposes. No short-term rental, no B&Bs within that zone either. I'm just curious, um, you know, when you guys do the zoning and you decide these scan, these scan, not these scans, what, what do you base on to give those right to these special people and not to these special people? So I assume you're referring to the 59 properties that were given the ability with the principal residence requirement. Yeah. So. So in a nutshell, there's general planning analysis that you undergo. What are the uses that are appropriate? What are the surrounding uses of the property? Is there any potential land use conflicts? So for instance, those 59 properties, those were selected and you kind of can kind of think of those as almost a pilot for this principal residence requirement. The original city rules back in 2021 that were proposed to council that were struck down and kicked back, we're gonna apply that principal residence requirement throughout the whole community. And council said, you know what, let's take a breath, maybe step back, maybe we trial it in one area, see how it goes before we expand it citywide. So really looking at that zone spe uh, specifically, it's right next to Mackenzie Village, right across from the resort. We have a lot of properties in there that were built with secondary suites recently. So they would be eligible to be used as a short-term rental under that principal residence rule so it made sense from a land use perspective for it to be appropriate but generally speaking looking at surrounding properties what the uses of the property are what the future uses of the properties are based on our official community plan as well so we so anyone can apply for an application for a land use change. It just isn't necessarily going to be supported by staff in accordance with policy. Council's the decision maker in the end. If you wanna apply for a rezoning and staff say, you know what, here's the policy that says we can't support it. We write a staff report that says in accordance with DS policy 23, staff can't support the application. And council says, you know what, we get what the policy says, but maybe there's merit in this particular application. That's why council is the final decision maker. So the next question, if opting in, if not opting in, is the city aware that 160 units at McKenzie Village, 135 of 160 are listed on Airbnb, majority owned by out of town country investors. So the city doesn't control who buys property. It's the nature of being a resort town. You're gonna to have people that are from outside of the community that wanna purchase within the community for investment purposes. The property was zoned in 2016 to accommodate short-term rentals. So people have been buying the units and operating them in accordance with the zoning since that time. Are any other municipalities opting in? As of right now, staff aren't aware of any other resort municipalities in our conversations that are opting into the legislation. Uh, most of them have actually been quite silent on it, and I'd say Revelstoke, again, is ahead trying to get this in front of council, come out to the community, and have a conversation about it. Part of the um, primary residency piece that we are discussing and considering is the fact that we could opt in or opt out with the potential to reassess that yearly. There's been community members who are concerned that that flexibility, shifting council, voting in, voting out, continuously puts that in a flip-flop basis. Are there, are there ways to kind of level that out or is this something to consider the long-term basis of like, hey, there's a, always going to be a chance due to our municipality that this flips back and forth. I'm probably going to end up passing this back to Paul anyways, but definitely something we've discussed as a group and part of the presentation tonight, we talked about how a, rob a robust housing analysis and economic analysis is really required in Revelstoke right now. We need that foundational knowledge, in, in my personal opinion, as a planner and as a resident here, before we kind of quickly opt in. We need to know what's actually happening on so many different sectors, economically, housing, short-term rental or not, long-term rental, residential capacity, um, and we don't quite have that yet. So once councils do have that foundational knowledge, I think they'll be able to have better decision-making skills moving forward. And you are right, when councils shift and new people come to the table, there's always the risk of that, for sure. And if this is opt-in, opt-out each year, 
there could be a change in the future, but maybe that's not necessarily a bad thing with that change, but we have the base knowledge to make decisions of a conscious choice. Paul? Do you have to do either? Do you have to either opt in or opt in? Can you just status quo? So if you don't opt in, then you have automatically not opted in, thereby opted out. So you can do it on an annual basis. If you opt in, you got to do it via council resolution. And just to add on to that, staff have been vocal to the province that this creates uncertainty. Always remember too, as local government, we're creatures of the province. We have to work within this legislative box that they put us in. It is a legal requirement. We cannot come up with our rules that are contrary to the provincial legislation. And when the province passes something, we have to abide by it. But staff have communicated that that is a challenge for a community like Revelstoke. It creates uncertainty. It's the reality of it. I have a comment, it's not a question, if I'm allowed to comment, okay. So regardless of opting in or, uh, or not, uh, I think hotels and motels or uh, tourist accommodation are there to accommodate tourists. If we multiply that to housing and personal housing, it removes housing from people who actually want to live there. The clientele in the house is not the same as someone living there. And I personally come from Montreal and I speak from experience. It's chaos and it's very difficult to control. So we should be a lot more strict about avoiding that situation and not putting forth short term rental. And you mentioned at the beginning, some people are totally against, some people are for, we should meet in the middle. I don't believe we should meet in the middle. I, should, I think we should avoid it. That's my comment. Thank you, sir. It's, it's not a question, but it's just to go there. Uh, I've been uh, owning a vacation rental for probably like six years now. And I think that the misconception is people think vacation rental, people come there to party and get loose. But from what I've seen is people come in, uh, a lot of time they're professional, they're above 30 years old and they go skiing, mountain biking, they come home, they have a hot tub, they have dinner, they go to bed early. You have on-site supervision, there's somebody there 24 seven. If there's any noise, the person on site gonna be able to stop it before. So by my experience, I think it's a misconception that people think vacation rental are gonna be trouble, but it's the opposite. For example, if I rent my house, which is a pretty big house with a pool and all the amenities, and it's four bedroom, I'm going to need to rent it to at least four or six people. Then you're going to have at least four or six people. And then what happened is, hey, come check out my crib. I got a cool place. And then people have dinner party and it creates more. Uh, there's more people in the neighborhood compared to when it's a vacation rental. People will re usually rent a vehicle and they come with one or two vehicles. There's less uh, parking spot. They're not parked everywhere on the street. And that's from owning a vacation rental since the last six years. Uh, no neighbor uh, complain at all, so I, I just think it's important that people, it's not vacation rental, it's free fall and people are partying with supervision, it's, it's a good thing and I think for each case is different, but right now I'm, I'm in the middle of, of something and I know what's going to happen. If I rent my beautiful apartment to six, seven people because that's the money I need to make it uh, even per month, the neighborhood's going to be more upset than what's happening. Yeah. So, if I can rent all or run property, I think it's a good thing, but every case is, is a different. And as you can see, this is a complex problem and complex, like everyone's on different sides of it. Yeah. Uh, why I, we, we agree that having uh, an analysis and thoughtful kind of movement towards it and a deeper understanding of what's happening from all perspectives is really important to move this forward. So have some appreciation that it's not so easy for council to make decisions on this because there are such varying perspectives. And regardless of what is your decision in the future, I want to thank you for like, doing this hard work. I know it's pretty tricky and you want to make everyone happy and it's black or white and you try to make everyone happy uh, and you're always thinking about the community. I just want to clarify something under this table that you've presented there. Uh, the, the first one, the standard zoning for C1, C6, R1B, um, R0.4, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it says maybe me that's not understanding properly. 
it's either a permanent resident that provides the, the um, management services or a not necessarily permanent resident that hires a property manager. So it, it just has to be a local property management company or a permanent resident. We want it. What we didn't we don't want the Toronto thing. That can't. What we didn't want is someone saying, "Oh, our property management company is based out of Kamloops." Yeah, yeah, right. We wanted it to be someone local, even if it's a local company. When you're doing those whole home rentals to address issues. Excellent. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And um, maximum uh, sleeping unit four, four bedrooms yeah. and eight people. Um, is that like? Set, is there another zoning that people could reapply if they want to build more room or something like that? Just out of curiosity. Yep. So the process for that would be to apply for what we call a development variance permit to vary that specific regulation to say instead of four units with maximum eight people, maybe six units with a maximum of 10 people or 12 people. Okay. Yeah. And is that through the building permit process or it's like a zoning amendment? So it's its own application called a development variance permit. and send an email to development at revelstoke.ca and we can provide you some good external guides that will give you some details on what that process yeah. looks like. Sorry, no, 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 yeah. no problem at all. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, excellent. Let's. You know, when you guys talk about all those fines that you like to give for the people that, you know, get caught, where, where does the money go? Uh, so when it comes to uh, the revenue generated through bylaw enforcement, uh, issuance of bylaw enforcement notices, whether it be municipal ticketing or bylaw offense notices, that revenue goes back into paying for the bylaw services itself. So in most cases, um, in most cases, bylaw services wouldn't be a full cost recovery department. It's a service being provided to the community. So Obviously, if we were trying to run a cost recovery department, that would be a very ticket heavy community, which obviously we don't always want to err on the side of ticketing. We do want to err on the side of uh, voluntary compliance first. And when that is not able to be achieved, then we would go for uh, issuance of tickets or other means for compliance. But ultimately, the revenue generated through any sort of enforcement methods like that do go back into the overall cost of operating the department. So it does offset, obviously, some of the costs associated with the department itself. Okay, so we got 96 questions on Slido that we're going to hopefully get it through a few of them that uh, probably answer some of the questions you guys have too. Okay, next, come on up. Yeah. So I, I, it's more of a comment than a question. Um, it was just I couldn't fit it in the limited number of characters up there. No problem. <laughs> um, in this upcoming analysis, um, I just wanted to highlight an issue that I don't know if people are thinking about, but I have personally observed. There are a lot, a lot, a lot of short-term property owners and operators across the province who are being shut down in other municipalities who have become very aware of these 14 resort municipalities that are still allowed to do this and are now incentivized to be selling their properties elsewhere and buying here. So whether or not the city makes a decision on what we're gonna do about this now there is a flood of investors looking to potentially be moving into town. And I'm just wondering how and if this will be included in the upcoming analysis. That is a very astute point to make and trying to quantify what the impact would be on that. I think from our perspective, it becomes really important to not support future rezoning applications to allow more short-term rentals than what we already have, which we're really happy that council had adopted a, a forward-thinking policy back in 2022 to address that. So even if we have more people and the demand is higher, as long as we don't allow for that land use in more areas, then there shouldn't be a greater proliferation than what we already have previously approved for, would be the hope. Well, if we opt in, then we got to think about how do we build on that opting in baseline to further restrict it? Do we want to further restrict it? Hence why you can see it's something that needs a little bit of time, more public engagement to really wrap our head around how to go. Um, I'm really awful with technology, but I just scanned that so I don't have to turn around every time, which is excellent now. So the next question is, if, opt, if not opting in, might council consider a rule like Bill 35 that only permanent residents of Revelstoke can operate short-term rentals as an economic benefit for citizens? 
Very great point. And I'm not going to wager a guess as to what council may or may not consider, but I know council really values community input and community feedback. So my guess is that they, well, I sh shouldn't say I'm going to guess, but I assume that they would want staff to facilitate a robust public engagement process so that council has a good idea of where the, the viewpoint of the community is. But honestly, if we go down this road of revisiting our short-term rental regulations, the first question we need to answer is what are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to restrict short-term rental at all costs in preservation of long-term rental accommodation or are we trying to use short-term rentals as a way for the locals of Revelstoke to participate in our tourism economy? That's the first question because once the community gives staff that direction, then we can craft regulations accordingly. If the direction to staff is protect long-term rentals and allow us to engage in the tourism economy and make it competitive for hoteliers, then you have all these different objectives that are competing and not necessarily in sync with each other. If we have one clear, concise objective, we can craft regulations to facilitate that all day long, monitor, evaluate, tweak as needed. But that's where the community has to come out and come to a consensus on it. So we'll be excited if uh, we're directed to do this project in, in October. Um, the next one, what's the litigation risk for the city for revoking a short-term rental zoning after allowing developers to develop and market based legal short-term rentals? We're gonna be really curious to see how this plays out in other areas where they don't have the option of opting in or opting out. We have had discussions with the province and the discussions with the province have gone along the lines of, well, if people wanna sue you, then they're suing you based on provincial legislation, which means they sue us, which isn't how it works in practice. The city gets dragged into this all the time. And honestly, the result is a lot of staff time going into it and taking us away from other community priorities. That's the reality. So we don't want to go that route. That's why we want to be thoughtful, methodical about how we go about this. Uh, beyond short-term rental control, has council considered other measures for housing, such as vacancy tax, speculation tax, or annexing city land for trailer parks? I'm not too sure about the last part of annexing city land, um, but when it comes to taxes, that's totally regulated under the province. The city sets the mill rate for different classifications. The province determines what classification you fall within as well as your assessed value that gets multiplied by the mill rate, which gives you your tax rate. So the city is really, again, handcuffed by what the provincial government allows us to or not to do for taxes. Um, if not opting in, how many illegal STRs have been shut down since April 2022? Bylaws came into effect. There's been a good bit that have transitioned to short or to long-term rental. The last numbers we ran was about 70, and we were at a point where we had 100 plus non-compliant properties. And I'll pass it over to Mr. Gibbs now because he has some numbers. Yeah. So um, when the legislature, when the regulations were first approved through council, one of the big things that council really emphasized to staff, and that was done through policy, was that it was an education first campaign. So we didn't go straight to just direct enforcement for, I believe, the first year, um, for the first year after these regulations came in. So essentially, the big thing was go out there, have conversations, send letters, give warnings, just start the open communication, start asking those questions, start answering those questions. So uh, for the first year. There was limited enforcement as we as we were directed that way. Now, as we go forward, we have stepped up on the enforcement side of things. Again, I, I we did bring forward a report to council at the end of November, uh, or was it November? Yeah, around November there, regarding uh, the new adjudication bylaw and the, why we needed to have this new system in place. And one of the big pieces was for enforcement of short-term rentals. It can be very difficult through some of our current municipal ticketing regulations that are set by the province. So bringing in this new adjudication system, it took time. To be honest, it took many months of waiting on the province to give us the approval to even begin that process. So since we've brought that in, uh, I believe we brought that, back, that in around December. And since that time, our bylaw staff have been working quite diligently on bringing a lot more of these two uh, forward and addressing a lot more of them. So to kind of give you an idea, in the last six months or so, we have issued approximately about 25 offense notices for different offenses related to short-term rentals. So that can vary between zoning regulations and business licensing regulations, it just depends. Um, and then uh, right now on the go, we currently have 14 properties that we are currently investigating right now. And that is split between three officers who are spending their time doing more than obviously just short-term rentals. So it's not something we can dedicate all of our time to, but we are dedicating a fair amount of resources towards this. Um, and then throughout the last six, eight months, 
about 34 properties. We've investigated about 34 properties and have they've even been, either been brought into compliance or returned to be in compliance. So that's done through both uh, the verification through our host compliance platform, so getting the information that uh, it was identified as a non-compliant property, or through our complaint software, which is C Click Fix on our website. So we have been working through quite a few of them, but to be honest, it is a very resource intensive issue, and we are investigating in numerous amounts of different types of offenses related to short term rentals. So, next question. I don't even want to say this one. Was there corruption or collusion at play between the city and Mackenzie Village developers? I've been at the city since, so no. And I've been at the city since December 2019, and I have nothing but incredibly positive things to say about every single person that works there, every single council member I've had the, the privilege of working with. The staff that work there live in the community. They want to do what's best. And if anyone came in and did a day in the life of any of the staff, all you're going to realize is like, oh, they're overworked. There's so much stuff on the go. They're trying to rapidly fix everything in what is generally quite a thankless job. And the staff do a phenomenal job. And things aren't as interesting as you might think they would be in terms of, you know, we see conspiracy theories that float out. I wish things were that interesting. You're literally working within a complicated legislative legal framework that you're just trying to do the best that you can and respect taxpayer money. That's what it comes down to in the end. This is not easy. Governing is not easy. And you know, trying to chalk things up to corruption and collusion as a way to, for it to make sense, it's far too simplistic. These are complex land rules that get in place. People are making the decisions at the time based on the best available information they have. Always in hindsight, there might be decisions that can be made a little bit differently with different requirements, but we're working with what we have right now. If not opting in, does the city acknowledge that the April 22 bylaws have removed economic opportunities for its citizens and given them to investors at Mackenzie Village? So the entitlements that are allowed for in the zoning at Mackenzie Village were approved in 2016. So that was approved through a rezoning application just like anyone else in the city can pursue right now. In April 2022, we said, we're going to give you a heads up that staff won't be supporting it. You can still go through that process, but staff won't be supporting it because when we did an analysis, we already have so much land zone for short-term rental, we need to focus on long-term rental accommodation and permanent resident housing within this community. Um, whether or not that negates economic opportunities for Revelstoke citizens, again, going back to when we revisit these bylaws, that's the first question we have to answer. What does the community want to achieve with this? If it is, we want to provide opportunity for Revelstoke citizens, we can craft regulations that allow you to operate short-term rentals in a non-intrusive way. So, so just to expand on that a little bit, um, is there a way to um, allow an area like Mackenzie Village? I, I, I would suggest that probably most people that live in Revelstoke don't live in Mackenzie Village, <laughs> and that they probably accept it as it is. Part of my concern is this. Um, some of everyone, some people here may have attended the information meeting that RMR put on last October, letting us, or November, whenever that was, to let us know what was coming down the pipe in, in their um, new developments. And I don't think anyone would disagree that the area around Mount Revelstoke Resort is aimed towards a, a boutique um, settlement of occupiers. There, there are homes there that commonly rent for $300,000 a week. CMH uh, used to rent a house that they charged for a group of eight people $200,000 a week. So there is obviously this boutique aspect coming to Revelstoke that most people will never afford. And a prime example of that is someone asked what the green fees might be when, when Cabot Pacific opens. Um, and it was suggested that it might be around $350 a day, right? So, and then someone from RMR suggested that if you really want to get on, on the course that is, Maybe you'd consider caddying for somebody. Yes, I would certainly consider caddying to be able to play Cabot. 
Well, excuse me, you're not playing. You're carrying some rich person's clubs. That's what a caddy so, is. So I just, I, I, I'm sorry, that was But what, 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 what I wanted to, the, my question is this, I'll get right to it. The, the real estate presenter at that meeting suggested to the group, and I think, you, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but suggested to Revelstoke City Council that they better vote for, would it be opting in? Because if they have a lack of, uh, of accommodations for people that are seeking to come here, the expansion projects at, their, at the resort stop dead. I, I think I know where you're getting at. And this is where, and, and I don't know the specifics of the detailed conversations that you're referencing, but in general, the biggest question the staff would have, if we opt in, is there going to be an impact on our visitation because you're effectively taking what are currently legal short-term rentals out of the market and what are the implications for this community as a result? They, it might be something where we say, you know what, we can live with those implications and we want to move forward. It might not be, but we don't know what we don't know right now. Right. And would there be an impact for development at the resort? Potentially, right? But we don't know what we don't know right so now. So to circle back then, I, I'm guessing that most people that reside in Revelstoke live in a subdivision and they probably don't mind that much that the apartment blocks down on Nickel Street uh, accommodate visitors. I, I don't think that, I don't think there may, like if you happen to live on a street that's gonna run up against their five or six story in the next phases, maybe those people might have, but if you're far enough away, I guess, and if, if you're not impacted by someone wanting to chop down trees because they don't have a very good view from their top suite. Uh, we, we know that's right. going Brian, on. You're, you're bringing up a good, and again, there's this, it's a planning question of, is it more appropriate to consolidate all the short-term rentals or a whole chunk of them in an area like Mackenzie Village where it's proximity to the right. resort? So yeah, it's, it's a good comment and we, and we thank you for your commentary. A, are you not getting a veiled threat from the resort saying- No. If, no, but what, but what they were suggesting was, we need X amount of bedrooms. And if we don't get that, if people can't go online and book a room, they're not gonna come. They're gonna go to Whistler, they're gonna go to Kicking Horse or whatever. Right, just to be respectful of everyone's time, we're gonna, me and you right. will meet and we're gonna talk about this a little bit more. Is that, is that okay? Sure, so finally though, what I wanted to know was, how much influence does RMR and Northland Properties have over this, vetting process that that you and and city council are so going through one what pressure is being brought to bear by them so no pressure and one thing that's important for everyone to note he did say that out loud so one thing that's important for everyone to note as planners the way that we are trained what we go to school for it's a soft skill expertise and what we do is we learn how to make decisions in the public interest it doesn't mean you're not going to make everyone happy all the time and it's how do you make decisions around land use that are in the public interest? We operate under a code of conduct under our, under our professional designation, and everything we do is in the public interest. Whether or not people have the same idea of the public interest is okay, but this is what we're trained for, and that doesn't mean that we cater to the largest developers in the community. It means we look at what is in the interest of the community. Are the large developers part of what the interest is in the community? Of course they are. They're big employers, so we, again, let's, let's find time right. to sit down and talk about in this in more detail. all I want to say is, I think most people here are concerned about affordability. For sure. And whether they can purchase, whether they can rent in the town that they live and work in. That is staff's priority right now and doing everything we can. And, and whether or not we're going to be a boutique town like Aspen or Vail mm -hmm. is, is obviously what other people are driving yeah. for. Yes. Thank you for thank you for the commentary. Okay. Um, so next question on Slido: If Revelstoke opts in, will short-term rentals be permitted in all principal residences throughout the city, or would they restrict principal residences in prescribed areas? So if we opted in and didn't build regulations on top, again, it would be citywide and not just one STR, two STRs. Could Bill 35 apply to Mac Village with the principal residence requirement, Kelowna, for example, revoke licensing? So yeah, a lot of other municipalities, they've had to rescind licenses where they weren't given a choice to opt in. Kelowna is one of them where they had whole condo hotels or condos that were dedicated for short-term rental. They've had to rescind every single license or prorate them until May. If we, 
If we did opt in to principal residence requirement, yes, again, in places like McKenzie Village, and not just McKenzie Village, other properties that we went over that are zoned for whole home short-term rentals would not be permitted to operate a short-term rental unless it is a principal residence. So, uh, I'm Francis, and you can all hate me on this one, but if we opt in, so currently, I live in my place, but with mortgage rates going up, when I have to resign, I'm not going to be able to afford there. I'm not going to be able to make it affordable. Right now, I get two people in every year. Uh, they pay probably 35% of their take-home pay. But if I can't afford my place, and I've worked very hard to get this place and hold on to this place, I would just like to say that I'm not going to rent it to anyone local. Mm -hmm. I'm going to contact lawyers in New York City. I'm going to contact people in Southern California. I'm going to contact Chicago. You're not going to get the house. I'm not going to get the house and my employer is gonna lose an employee. So there are unintended consequences. And hate me, love me, fucking don't give a shit. I don't care. Just, just a reminder, we'll try to keep, uh, oh, that's, that's okay, I get it. You don't wanna hear our office. So I would like to just say real quick, one of the things to keep in mind is because we are in a unique position here as a resort municipality, we, as the community, get to choose whether or not we are opting into this. Like Mr. Simon had alluded to, there are other communities like Kelowna that did not get that opportunity. So we, we would like to take full advantage of that opportunity to actually go through, do a proper analysis, determine what the economic impact would be, regardless of which way we go. But just keep in mind, we are in a very unique position to be able to do that. Most other communities didn't get that same privilege. So this is the stuff we're going to be working through over the course of the next little while here, trying to determine what the real world effect is if we were to opt in or if we were to stay opted out on this community. Because at the end of the day, the reality of it is it affects the people that live here the most, and it does affect local businesses that are operated by some of you people in this room or others that are watching online, but we do need to determine what the real economic impact will be if we were to opt in or not opt or to stay opted out. So just remember, this is a bit of a process, but we are in a really unique position here to properly implement this and then and or make a regulations that are actually going to work for the needs of the community. So just to recap. In October 2024, staff will be bringing back a report to council that says here's how the legislation has been implemented so far, learn a bit from how other municipalities have been going through the process, and that would ultimately result in a conversation with council where if they want staff to do a deep dive into this, we will allocate budget to it, we will have timelines, project management plans that say here's how we are going to tackle an update to our short-term rental regulations and making this decision on whether or not we opt in. So it would be a project that would be undertaken from October through early 2025 most likely. So the February 29th is only for the first year. We had to make a decision to opt in by February 29th for it to be effective in 2024. There was not enough time for us to do a proper analysis. Yes. So it's, and again, it's, you can opt in, opt out every single year. There is not enough time to make a proper informed decision by February 29th. That was council that made the decision. How do you make a proper economical analysis? You mentioned make a, an economical an analysis before deciding, but what are like? How do you do that? Just on top of my mind, if if we have more uh, short-term rental homes, maybe the tax is higher, maybe it brings more money in, but then there's less uh, housing uh, uh, available for people who live here. Like how do you balance that? You work with a good economist that has some experience in doing things like this. And we've talked to a couple that are, are quite creative and you know, we would need to understand so much to, to unpack with this, but right off the bat, if you opted in, how many short-term rentals would then no longer be allowed to operate? What is the impact on visitation? What does that look like for an impact on businesses? What are the businesses that rely on it? And start trying to peg some numbers. It's never, it's, it's partly an art and partly a science. But just to get a general idea of what are the implications rather than flying blind and opting in and saying, well, let's see what happens. What happens if we opt in and it reduces our visitation by 20%? What are the impacts on this town that has grown in part to rely on tourism in conjunction with our other industries? That's why we don't take it lightly and we want to make 
make sure that we're providing information to council and the community so everyone can be as informed as possible. It's never going to be 100% perfect or 100% accurate. That's why it's forecasting and projections and going based on best available data. We'd be working with good qualified economists. Okay, so the follow up question, will the economist also be socialist? Like, <laughs> because you have a social impact and you touch base it, you say if it reduces 20% uh, of the people visiting because there are less, less uh, accommodation, but, but normally, uh, the economy will provide for that if there's a there's a demand and, and build hotels. So, so, there, so that's, that's, it will balance out. So a very good point. There's the there's the the intangible stuff that is harder to quantify in terms of those social impacts. And I would like to give a shout out to Taha Atia, who's our social development coordinator. And this is his bread and butter. And that's where we'd be working with him to kind of apply that lens to this whole topic. But you're right, it's complex. And the key from our perspective is. However we choose to tackle this, it's reporting, monitoring, evaluation, and tweaking our rules so that we're continually meeting the needs of the community. May I have another question? So I just, I just want to make sure that if there's anyone else in the room, you know, feel free if you do want to come up, you know, we can form a bit of a line. We just want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to, to ask questions. If we can change our mind about opting in every year, why? I, I don't quite get why we would opt in at all. We can make our own regulation and who cares about opting in? <laughs> we can so, opt out anyway next year. So. That, that's, a very, that's a very good point. Hey, thanks for having us. I appreciate it. The moment to talk, I also appreciate. I'm Grant Helgeson. I'm a project manager in town. I'm a homeowner. I'm a landlord. i um, been here for a long time. And when I'm looking around, I'm seeing some of my closest friends have been in this community for a decade plus. I can think of a, a, a nurse, a registered nurse, Rosetta Mitchell, who has not been able to find a house in town to rent now. She's right at the cusp of able to buy a place. I hope that happens for her. But I'm watching this happen in my demographic, kind of that 30 to 45. It's people who haven't, haven't gotten the mark. I feel very fortunate that I did get in when I got in. But it seems to me that, <clears throat> excuse me, when we look at the short-term housing and we look at places that are just like, I have one up the road from me, and I also have a hotel near me too. Hotels are great, they manage the guests well. I think it's an awesome experience. When I look at a home near me and see it just a full-time short-term rental, it just feels to me like a commodification of our housing stock. And it, it grits at me, it really does. I, I don't begrudge those people. I think that they bought into those risky investments. Um, I'm, I don't wanna take anything away from that. If you're here in the room, like, I applaud you, you've made money, you made a good play. That's great. But moving forward, can we allow, I mean, what, what percent, like I'm just doing some rough numbers. It looks like there's about 3,800 private dwellings in Revelstoke-ish. Yep. And I think there's somewhere around, like the math is hard and I know, I don't know paid prescription or excuse me, subscription, but somewhere like 500 plus short terms on Airbnb, 550? We're at about, and based on our host compliance data, we got 300, 310 active listings in and around Revelstoke. Okay, cool. And I'm sure that you guys all know, and we all know, and I all know many people who are doing this under the table through all sorts of different ways. Um, let's take, so 330, 300? Yeah, sure. Okay, so now we're at, what's that? Legal? Does that mean legal? We have, I think that just means listed on Airbnb. We have about 200 and 60, 250 of them that are that are licensed, and some of them may have appropriate zoning. They just don't have a valid business license for it, so that's part of our enforcement efforts. So I, my question, I kind of have a two-phase question. Um, I've looked to a community like Hood River, Oregon, who actually has the Columbia River running right through the town. It's mountainous, it's beautiful. Many of you have probably been there. They came up against this about seven years ago, and their proximity to Portland, Oregon is only an hour away, and so they had to come up with a solution fast. And same kind of thing. There were people in the community that had licensed Airbnbs, and they said, you know what? This isn't working for us. We're a small town. We're hemmed in by mountains and the river. And so they, they, they had to go to bat, and it got a little ugly for them because when the town made this decision, the developers were pissed. Um, they were sued. But what they actually did is they said that any Airbnb, which I think is pretty, or any short-term, let me back up, any home could actually have up to in their case, two and a half months of short term. So if you were a school teacher and you're taking your family to Europe for a dream trip, you can short term your house out while you're away. Um, but they just abolished short term rentals year round throughout the community. And I've looked at that and I've thought like, man, if we could only get there. Yeah. And it feels like we're really close to that with the solution that the province is offering. Um, I've read it, I'm not a lawyer, but it just seems like I, I can't 
maybe you can help me understand the compelling agreement to have a commodified housing market outside of our hotels. Like, let's build more hotels on the highway. Like, let's get the frontier, but let's get that property, let's develop it. But like, how do we keep commodifying housing? We'll have to go for a beer because this is a nice philosophical discussion. But but no, I can find it. I'd love that. That's a it's a it's a it's a fair point. And I don't think you're going to get any planner in the world that's going to disagree that within North America the housing market has been commodified to a certain extent. And it's not just one thing. This is the this is the biggest issue. When you talk about solving the housing crisis, it's not just clamp down on short-term rentals and that's done. It's it's one piece of the puzzle having an effective regulatory framework. There's so much that we have to do. And to be honest, the way that housing has evolved within Canada over since really the mid-90s, it has become commodified. And that's due to all the way from the top federal government regulations and pulling out of affordable housing, provincial government not building enough affordable housing and not having effective oversight of the, the ownership market. And then local government, you know, our biggest issue has been not zoning stuff appropriately for multi-unit housing because of nimbyism and people saying, I only want single family homes, but why is everything so expensive? Well, we need higher density housing with some diversity. So, you know, we're working on it as best as we can to try and get that out. But again, everyone, we always refer back to it, this legislative box that we're put in we're creatures of the province, we do everything we can, we try to utilize the tools, but very good point about commodification of the housing market. Very, very good point. Thanks for the thoughtful response. <laughs> I'd love to go have a beer, seriously, and chat about this. I won't be yelling to take all the short-term <laughs> rentals away. Um, but I think the, the one follow-up point to what you just said, and that's a really great point, is that we don't have control over what's happened in the province and the outside foreign buyers and all those things. But what we do have control right now is that we could end short-term rentals in our community as, as a business model. And we could still provide for the people who are actually homeowners here when they go on holiday, have someone in their house. So okay. thanks for considering it. Thanks for the evening. Sure. I'm going to come find you for a beer. <laughs> Sounds good. Francis. I uh, learned about this meeting about three hours ago, and I decided I'd come just to listen, but I can't help myself. <laughs> Um, I'm going to get a little philosophical at the start and just tell you about uh, problems I've found in my own life with things that I do. Sometimes when you're really close to something, you're embedded in it, immersed in it, you don't see the obvious. So let me tell you what I think I understand just from being here for a brief period of time. The system that's being presented to us by the city is, seems to essentially say that if you're out of town or you're a resort property owner, you're going to do okay. Just to remind the city, the whole idea of short-term rentals uh, came about because of affordability issues. People that had private residence couldn't afford the taxes. I'm certainly in that situation. And one of the options to get to, uh, to work through that, and this is history. I'm going to talk a little bit about the past. One of the options was to have the option to do short-term rental or a suite in your house, to pay the mortgage, to be able to afford to live here, if you're not a resort person or somebody with a lot of money. Okay, so that's a little bit of history. Um, I don't want to lose my train of thought, but I'm going to go uh, with, I'm also, I'm two things. I'm a property owner. I'm a fellow that's on pension that doesn't have a lot of money. And I'm also a, a landlord. Oh my God, okay. Look at my business plan. It's posted on the uh, Chamber of Commerce, okay. I have three objectives. Affordable rent, quality unit, and a stable, stable neighborhood, okay. Those are my objectives. How many landlords have that as their business plan? Okay, let me tell you what's destroying that business plan. A speculative real estate market, which sees my assessment go up 17%, 15%, 8%, follow my taxes, okay? Insurance that's gone through the roof because of forest fires and other things, and, and municipal taxes, okay? So I have a business plan. I'm doing what everybody says I should be doing, but I'm being destroyed by the system. Now, here's my point. You're taking this rigid model and saying you can only do short-term rentals here, here, and here. I understand why that is, because it's controversial, okay? If you opt in and you have residents on site, it's gonna be a lot less controversial. I'm not suggesting you do that, okay? But the point is, you're, you're, you're not opting in, which is a question out there perfectly illustrated, Benefits, out-of-town people that have money, they're simply investing in property, and the resort. Your restrictions on where you can do short-term rentals is that it, it negatively affects people that want to have affordability here. End of story. Thank you very much. Thank you for that commentary.
move on to the next Slido question. So if not opting in, when did McKenzie Village go from 10% master plan STRs to 100% development of STRs? Which council, what date? So I just want to clarify, because I have gone through this original amending bylaw that came into effect in 2016 many, many times. There have been no changes to the entitlements. The density that was approved for McKenzie Village has not changed since 2016. The total amount of commercial space that McKenzie Village is entitled to has not changed since 2016. The use of short-term rental and how much short-term rental is permitted at McKenzie Village has not changed since 2016. If anyone has any questions, we are happy to provide them the link to the original amending bylaw where that zone was originally established back in 2016. Yeah, I just had a couple comments as well. Um, I think short-term rentals exist within the context of the general, more broad housing crisis in Canada. And our town is probably the most condensed example of all of the contributing factors that are playing into a shortage of housing, which has so many implications, like squeezing people's income, um, a lack of availability for people to be involved in community building, volunteering, and just like economic opportunities for everyone in general. Um, it's sort of a relationship between income potential and cost of living. And um, outside of, you know, rich people moving here or people who have significant accumulated capital, like the income ratio to price in Revelstoke is outrageous. Like no one can live here based on a local income in terms of affording a, a home. And increasingly the rental market is going up too. So you may not even be able to rent. Um, this is kind of a broader trend in Canada uh, as we sort of move into this like rental economy. And I would just encourage the people here to think about what plays out in the longer term if we increasingly move into a town that caters to speculative real estate investment. Like there's an intergenerational fairness piece on providing opportunities for the town to flourish um, on a longer time scale. And uh, I think it's really important that like framing that with framing this whole discussion within that context is something to keep in mind. Because um, it's like a cycl cyclical thing, right? Property values go up based on the valuations, which are now increasingly or in certain places have been dependent on um, or the STR income potential is increasing the valuations of the real estate here, despite regulations coming and going. It's people do things illegally, you know, and, and it just leads to more further speculation, um, which makes it less affordable. Um, so I would just say, please craft policies uh, when you approach this that have that sort of long-term focus on housing sustainability. Um, I am of the opinion that like, if we move to a renter's economy, we need long-term rentals. And I don't see any short-term rental contributing to helping address that problem. Like every new unit that gets built, that gets turned into a short-term rental, never goes into the like long-term rental pool and just further increases the problem. Um, and then on a more uh, technical note, I think like looking at vacancy rate might be something to consider in terms of triggering whether we or how we decide to like opt into allowing short term rentals like a healthy vacancy rate is four to eight percent that's sort of like the agreed upon number in like developer you know economic circles i think so i would say you know our vacancy rate is probably like zero or negative we probably like towns like banff have like effectively as negative vacancy rate we're probably something similar um, so i would say yeah maybe you look at like vacancy rate as a trigger point if it can be incorporated into like you know, whether we allow short term rentals or not. So. It's a very good point. And getting vacancy data in this town is incredibly challenging and getting it consistently is even more so because CMHC doesn't collect it for municipalities under 10,000 people. So we've tried to collect vacancy data in this town. It is a it is a challenge, we will say, but it's one that we're going to continue to look at and we'll be doing a housing needs assessment soon. We're required to do them and we're going to try and find a consistent way to do it because vacancy rate is incredibly important. And I agree with you, we probably do have somewhere around a zero or a 1% vacancy rate, which is very, very challenging in the rental market in this town. Substantially less than zero. Yeah, so. 
Yeah. We, uh, people are very much underhoused. Yeah, so it's a long-term issue, right? Like we're looking, you know, we all want to make money to pay our high inflated mortgages and our high inflated property values. Um, I mean, I kind of argue that we need a giant deflation event to bring things back in line or else like where are your kids going to live? They're all going to leave. In fact, they're probably all going to leave Canada and go to Mexico or something. Yeah. But like, if we don't fix the housing problem, um, it's not a good outlook, right? Yeah. For, unless, you know, you are a capital person. Um, so that's my take on it. Thanks. It's yeah. great commentary. Thank you. Uh, the next question, if not opting in, what date in which, oh, we already did that one. Uh, why are there short-term rentals listed on Airbnb that are in direct contravention of current bylaws? So if there are any that are in contravention, again, note it on C-Click Fix. And if you have any more questions, contact Development Services directly so our bylaw group can look into it. So just a commentary, I'm not an economist and I'm sure you guys have better resources and stuff and I have hear people on one side for vacation rentals, on one side against vacation rentals. Uh, I'm guessing if you do opt in and just completely remove vacation rentals, it will force sell uh, investors will, you know, they will need to sell otherwise they'll just be stuck with an asset that they need to pay and can't make money out of it really much for what they paid for. So that will probably decrease the value of every single home owner in Revelstoke. It, would that potentially be correct? If, it, if there's a flood of supply and demand, there's a flood of investors selling, it will probably every single resident in Revelstoke that owns a house will see their value decrease. I've seen studies that talk short-term rental eligibility can increase a property's value maybe 5%, maybe 20%. It's very challenging to ascertain what directly impacts a property's value. You know, doing proper statistical analysis is, it, it can be challenging. However, speculating on what may or may not happen, it's very challenging to work that out through proper robust analysis. Sorry, I didn't express myself properly, I think. Uh, I'm not talking about the added value i'm talking about the, right now yep, every the, single owner yep. in revelstoke if my house just to make like easy calculation on my property assessment tax it says your house is worth a million dollars if i would go sell it tomorrow that's what it would be worth if revelstoke would opt in and you said there's 30 percent vacation rentals in revy uh we got about 17 percent that are eligible to be used and only about 8% of those are being used as short-term Do rental. you know how many would be, if you opted in, would be non-eligible, so not owned by permanent resident? Of the 660 short-term rentals that are eligible to be operated today, and keep in mind there's only about 300 that are operating, it would be uh, 560 of them would be impacted by the principal residency rule. Okay, so if tomorrow Revelstoke opts in, it means that there's most likely to be 500 houses to be for sale in Revelstoke Sorry, tomorrow. I just want to clarify, I misspoke. It would be about 250 because about half of those are at the resort that would be exempt from the principal oh, residence. Okay. You can see how complex this legislation no, gets us. We're trying, trying to work trying through it on the fly. Yep. Both sides, so yep. if, obviously, if owners want it to be affordable, people that are here in town, they own a house, but they want to opt in, but what would be the impact on their balance sheet if they do opt in? It's a very good question. If we do opt in, is, is everyone in Revelstoke, there's gonna be 200 houses for sale tomorrow and everyone's worth is gonna go down? P potentially, right? And that's a very good question and trying to speculate on how much that depreciation could be or if there even is a depreciation. As I'm saying. Well, that, that yes. But how about someone that bought a house that, you know, they finally managed to just get the right amount of money to just buy a house and they did buy a house today and tomorrow their house is worth half. And then they default on their mortgage when it exactly. comes time for Exactly, and their loan to value it, when they need to refinance it, their... Yeah, that, I, that would mess up also half of the town right now. So I guess it's a tricky situation. It's challenging to speculate, but I also think too, if you opted into the principal residency rule, there's going to be some of those that are just going to hold them, some of them that might rent them out to family, long-term rental. It's, it's really hard to specifically determine how many would go right into the market so and the timing of them going into the market as well. Where I, my commentary was aiming to go is that if 
you know, either opting in or out would cause an impact on the residents of Revelstoke. Uh, would just the way to decrease the, make it more affordable, you know, supply and demand. The supply is pretty much bad, but the demand is pretty constant. So if we just build more houses in Revy, would it make it more affordable? Well, I can tell you from the planning department's perspective, we are going through our zoning bylaw rewrite, and the intent is to increase our supply of multi-unit residential housing for long-term residents within the community, both on the home ownership side and on the rental side, and both on the market rental side and the non-market rental side. So that is our focus right now. So we want to see a supply of the right type of housing within this community. So where I'm going is, as a community, should we put more our efforts in flooding the market with building a lot of houses, which would make it more affordable, rather to put our, you know, fighting black or white, and then it ends up affecting everyone. Without going into such a rabbit hole, one of the other big factors we ought to consider with building the right type of supply in this town is our construction capacity. We only have so much capacity to build so many houses in this town each year, and it takes time to get these big projects going as well. So just something else to keep in mind. Okay. Yeah. Great, great commentary. You can see how it gets quite complex. Yeah. Um, my question was for bylaw. Um, how many bylaw offices are there in Revelstoke? Speak into that so we can both read now. <laughs> um, how many bylaw offices are there in Revelstoke at the moment? Uh, so currently our bylaw enforcement team or bylaw compliance team does consist of uh, the, what is considered 2.6 officers. Um, that's currently what we're budgeted for. So essentially that means that we have two full-time officers and then an almost full-time bylaw officer, well, which is the point six. So uh, with the budget request this year, we did request to increase that number up to the three. So we do have 3.6. Uh, at this time, we would have, or sorry, uh, after that's fully adopted, we'd have three full-time officers uh, working within Revelstoke. Okay, so three full-time officers working in Revelstoke because it's bylaw, you're doing a bunch of other jobs. Correct. So there's currently on Airbnb 368 Airbnbs that are on there. How many um, compliances have you handed out? Um, well, as far as the, the, the overall number for the, we've investigated approximately about 34 properties. And so that consists of uh, some that were investigated due to a complaint that were then determined to be compliant, or we worked with the owners to then gain compliance. And so one thing to remember is like it's, we, as we work through a lot of these, it's not just Airbnb, there are numerous other sites as well that we are working to try to address on those ones. But we have, what is it, approximately, ooh, sorry, about approximately 263 licensed uh, operators. And so on, between the host platforms, based on our host compliance software, we have approximately about 330 uh, in total for the whole surrounding, Revelstoke and surrounding areas. Okay, and then my other question is, so if you have a homeowner that isn't complying and you issue them with a fine and they're being listed with a, like a property manager, is the property management company also being issued fines? Uh, it would depend on the situations, to be honest with you. They're, the legislation is very specific as far as who we can serve ticketing tickets to. There are different ways of gaining compliance. At the end of the day, the way it really it falls to the property owner. The big thing to remember is at the end of the day, compliance to the bylaws is the responsibility of the property owner. So the, the, at this point, we are mainly pursuing the property owners themselves. Okay. Um, I have a property management company in town, and I think it would be interesting maybe to look in, because we have to comply with consumer protection, and looking into that and then issuing the property management companies fines as well, just because a lot of the time people will come to us with their property that isn't legal, and want us to kind of take the rap for it. Um, so yeah, that could be something that might make it easier for bylaw officers or also reaching out to like the direct companies. I think there's only four in town um, and sitting like meetings to cover, to make sure like we're all complying with our properties. Yeah, absolutely, right? Like, and it's, this is one of the challenges with the new legislation is part of the new Bill 35 that we're dealing with is going to be the registry. Um, so all properties that are going to be listed will be, or any property that's listed on any of the platforms will be required to be registered through that registry and removal of those non-compliant business or non-compliant operators will be a piece of that legislation. So we are still working with the province to try to get some clarity on how that's actually going to work in, in the real world. Um, but absolutely, it is something we will be looking at. 
honestly, at this point, based on the numbers that we were receiving, the number of complaints, we do itemize it based on the severity of the complaint and the severity of the non-compliance, and then we address them based on the severity of that, uh, the severity of ranking of that offense. But, you know, honestly, that is not, uh, it is something we will be considering for sure. Thank you. So, some more questions from Slido. Uh, one of the questions is, how can, uh, how can short-term rentals within the McKenzie Village development promote up to 12 guests, stay two to three bedroom, bylaw states and more than two guests? So the bylaw relating to the two guests is for the spot zone properties, as well as uh, the ones that we referenced in our downtown zone, our Victoria Road commercial zone, the 59 properties adjacent to Hay Road. Uh, within the comprehensive development zone, the specific regulations about short-term rental are embedded within that zone. So you can see 15 years of the city having different planners coming through, promoting different short-term rental regulatory ideas within different zones has created a bit of a convoluted framework. And that package that a lot of you have picked up tries to distill it to make it as simple as possible. But we encourage you guys, if you have questions about what the requirements are for each specific zone, refer to that short-term rental fact sheet. It'll give you a good quick reference there. Uh, our citizens right to feel that city of Revelstoke has unfairly catered to developers, allowing Kids Village to become short-term rental marketplace, favoring forward investment. Again, the biggest rule tonight is we don't want to focus on the history. The approvals that are in place, we are working with in the context of those existing approvals and we want to continue to move forward. I can tell you since my time here in December 2019, the primary focus of the planning group, of the engineering group, of city council has been housing, housing, housing for long-term permanent residents. That is where our focus is right now. And that is where, too, again, our priority, seriously, this zoning bylaw is critical to help address our housing issues. We need to get that done. And that is why we are looking at deferring so we can be thoughtful about the short-term rental conversation as well. Uh, advertising new developments in Mackenzie Village is short-term rental if opting in would entirely. So we already talked about that. Yes, they would be impacted by the principal residence requirement. Uh, Bill 35 was adopted by Revelstoke. Uh, would homeowners throughout the city in their entirety of Revelstoke be permitted to operate short-term rentals. We've already talked about that. Yes, they would, unless we built regulations on top of it. Um, a lot of these are starting to get duplicates. Do you feel taking local homes off Airbnb may cost our tourist industry millions as families who don't want to rent hotels or condos will travel elsewhere? Excellent point. Doing a robust analysis to look at the impact on visitation by opting in would be a critical piece to help inform council and the community as to whether or not that is in the public interest here. Uh, Bill 35 states principal residence requirement plus one additional suite. Does this allow? Yes, it would allow two STRs if we opted in, unless again we build regulations on top of it. Will provincial short term rental regulations supersede the legality of municipal bylaw regulations? The provincial regulations are intended to serve as the floor, and then the city can build on top of it. Um, whenever we ask the province, questions on legalities, the response is super consistent and very, very helpful. It says, get your own legal advice. So really, really helpful for us. So then you get 152 municipalities in BC all getting 152 different illegal opinions. Um, currently own and operate a licensed STR in town. It's not my primary residence, but I do have a caretaker living in suite on premises. Will I be shut down? So that would be totally dependent on what your zoning is. Again, we went through that framework of what the existing rules are. If we opted in, as long as the individual that is operating the, the short-term rental, as long as that is their principal residence, regardless of whether they're renting or they're an owner, then they would be okay. Um, if not opting in, how many fines and how much fine revenue has been collected from illegal short-term rentals and illegal Airbnb since April 2022? We might need to come back to that one to get the specific numbers, but Mr. Gibbs? Uh, I don't I don't have all the specific exact revenue data. It is published every year through our uh, statement of financial information. We do post anything, any revenues that are generated through um, municipal sources. Uh, but well, honestly, one thing to remember with this is opting in or not like if we were to opt in this doesn't fix any of the concerns overnight that is one thing i do want to make sure that everybody is aware like it doesn't fix things overnight it doesn't mean that the province is going to roll out an enforcement team to help roll knock down all these doors and and bring everybody into compliance that's that's not the reality the reality of it is is if we were to opt in and go through that process it will take time it will take time for us to work through all of the non-compliant people now, and it's gonna continue. It'll be something that'll be a main maintenance issue over many years to come. So at this point, just, just to remember, there is uh, that background piece of it as well that we do have to consider of, if we are opting in the job of enforcement, there are gonna be some tools that the province will be giving us, uh, which does involve the increased fines, 
but we will still have to, the uh, predominant of the enforcement will be fall onto our bylaw department, which does mean that we will need to increase our bylaw department size if we are having to deal with that many properties that often. So there is that balancing act of reviewing the, the amount of revenue we're going to be generating through fines and then also the cost to provide that service. So there is a bit of a balancing act when it comes to that. Just again, something to consider. Really good question here. If not opting in, how much MRDT is opting in doesn't have so much to do with this other than it could impact MRDT, which is the municipal regional district tax that we collect on hotel providers and short-term rental operators. And that money comes back into the community in some respects, and then the province gets a whole chunk of it. Uh, how much was collected from STRs last year and where are the funds allocated? So MRDT we collected uh, in between October 2022 and November 2023, it was 1.3 million. About $200,000 goes into what we call our online accommodation platform fund, which goes directly towards supporting affordable housing construction within the community. And the other portions of it go towards marketing, tourism events, and destination management within the community. Uh, do you feel short-term rental, do you feel, sorry, City of Revelstoke catering short-term rentals to developers over citizens only worsening class divide, pushing locals out of town and regressing our tourist economy? This gets back again. If we are going to be revisiting our short-term rental regulations, first thing we got to answer, what are we trying to achieve with it? Then that gives staff their marching orders to craft regulations to achieve that outcome for council to consider. Will removing upscale STR from Airbnb really provide affordable housing or will it reduce tourist influx and provide expensive housing? Really good comment. Are we going to have more dark windows in the community if we opt in and we have all these expensive homes that are not being used? And the owner says, well, I'll keep it. It's my second home and I'll come there and my friends will come there once in a while, potentially. And is it really going to provide affordable housing or is it going to be a house with, you know, six units that is rented for 1500 bucks a bedroom like is the going rate right now in Revelstoke? Can I give your uh, voice a quick thanks. break there, Paul? Yeah. Uh, thanks all for putting this on, um, and thanks everyone who, who's stuck around this long to uh, to listen. If you're if you're here right now, you're clearly interested in housing and and really care about it. So um, I think we definitely need more of these conversations, not less. I work for the city of Revelstoke too, so um, you didn't come here to listen to me necessarily, but. <clears throat> I'm, I'm Taha, I'm the social development or community development coordinator, but a lot of my work is, is with social sector. And um, yeah, if, if uh, I, I think in addition to this event, there's also the, um, the uh, housing summit that, re that the city of Revelstoke put on, that's on YouTube as well. There's a ton of content on there. Um, and I recorded a, a podcast as part of my role with uh, the city as part of the poverty reduction strategy. Uh, it's called Revel Broke. You can find it all over. Uh, it, it's about affordability. We, we um, really did, we, we did our best to convey the difficulties that people are facing uh, in terms of affordability, but also what other resort communities like us from all over North America have been through. Um, and yeah, like these, these conversations are really necessary to um, give council and, and staff the direction that they need to, to make a really hard decision that's going to affect all of us. So, yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks, Taha. Oh, I, I, no more questions for the rest of the night for anyone wearing blue. I beat Brian. No, to Brian's point, I get asked a lot, how come the city's not issuing tickets to people who violate um, I think it's important that, and Just you have an amazing ability, Kenny, to, to dummy it down that I can understand it. If you could explain to the people tonight, and this is a question that Brian's asked and others, we have a municipal ticket information system that's antiquated, and we have the adjudication bylaw. Can you explain in the easiest terms the difference between the two and what the city is doing so we can clamp down on violators? And the difference between the two systems as we transition from MTI conventional to adjudication bylaw. Thank you. Yep. So I'll give a quick rundown. We are kind of nearing the end of the event, so I'll try to speed through this as much as I can and, and try to give you as much information. Ultimately, the province enact gives us three different tools for enforcement: long form information, which is done through the provincial court system. Uh, municipal, which essentially, it's it's similar to an injunction style. Uh, the 
municipal ticketing information, which is a municipal ticket. Again, if that is disputed, that goes through the provincial court system. The municipal ticketing information uh, legislation is very specific and has very specific requirements on uh, how, you, how you have to serve that, who it could be served to, the timelines, for, uh, the timelines for disputes, everything like that is laid out in that legislation. So it can be a lot more restrictive and a lot more challenging because one of the big pieces of it is you do have to physically serve an individual with that municipal ticket. Uh, the a bylaw adjudication system, which we've recently implemented, is a similar system, but it allows, it's an opt-in system that has to be approved by, uh, we get a motion passed by council, and then it goes over to the Office of the Attorney General's for review and approvals. If we are then added into the schedule, we are then allowed to utilize that ticketing system. So with that, there is lower fines amounts, but it is a very, it's a much simpler system to be able to use. It pulls it away from the court system and allows you to do uh, what's called a screening officer position. So you can re-review all of these offenses in, uh, in house before they go to an adjudicator, a third party adjudicator. Again, it's trying to reduce some of the time occupying the court systems. And with that comes the ability to mail the ticket and that can be done or it can be left on the door of a, an individual. It can be left on the car, but that can be done to then allow us to uh, serve it to these out of town owners where we wouldn't necessarily be able to before you know we would try to knock on your door we try to serve you the ticket or now under this new system we would then be able to mail this the ticket to the individual whether they live in town whether they live in Kelowna whether they live in this United States it does not matter so it did allow us to then be able to actually have additional tools to be able to enforce excellent thanks Kenny okay I want to I do want to say something because you made a comment that I don't think is entirely um, that complicated. You talked about how complex it is to try to figure out uh, where we are financially with a short-term rental versus, say, a long-term rental. So, based on two years ago, there was a house in our subdivision that I have intimate knowledge of. I rented it for 11 months while I built my own house. And I became good friends with the owner and I became good friends with the builder. So I know the house intimately. And based on their information, uh, so they, they subsequently sold that house. It sold to someone from Toronto that never saw it. It was bought sight unseen. Based on the information that they had posted on the internet and based on um, full, being fully booked for a four month season, that house would have earned with, with two vacation rentals within the one structure, $250,000 for four months, just four months. So maybe, so it's a nice home. Maybe long-term you could get seven, maybe 8,000 per month long-term, okay? So we're looking at 28,000 to maybe 32,000 over four months compared to 250,000 based on a full house. So almost 10 times the long-term rent. And, and this is what I'm getting at with Revelstoke. I, no one wants to see it become a boutique town where, where all you have to do is look at the examples, people that have been flushed out of towns like Vail and like Aspen, where they're commuting, where professional people are commuting an hour and a half to go do a job in that town, but they can't afford to live there. So they're lit, they're living in hovels somewhere else. And that's what's headed here. So we know for a fact that CMH Nomads, which is now defunct, they had a horrible accident last year and they don't do it anymore. But they charged for eight people $200,000 a week. We know for a fact that the Revelstoke Bighorn has rented out for as much as $300,000 a week. Now that includes a helicopter and a guide. But what I'm saying is there's a trickle down effect. I knew a Red Seal carpenter that th three or four years ago, he was paying $500 rent for a bedroom. That bedroom was a closet in someone else's bedroom, right? So it, it's not that complicated to understand how expensive short-term rentals. There is, there is a profit taking here that is just unethical. Okay. 
I just wanted to clarify that it isn't that complicated. I'm going on the information that these people that are renting these places out put out themselves. Those are not numbers that I made up. BC Hydro wants to hire electri uh, electrical engineers that can't, aff they could afford that house. But, right? Okay, I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, um, uh, as uh, Paul mentioned, my name is Councillor Aaron Orlando. I just want to take an opportunity to thank staff for doing this. Uh, I've been through dozens and dozens of uh, hug and slugs on the uh, short-term rental topic over the years, and I uh, just uh, want to commend you for uh, putting on a good show uh, and uh, with all the technology, broadcasting live as well. And one question more for the audience instead of the, the panel here is um, the Slido app where you can ask the questions. Uh, do, what do you all think? Is that something to keep for future things? Is that good? Bad? Yeah, it's yeah, it's good. Okay, you guys, again, thank you guys so much. Yeah. So, real quick on that note, just uh, as Councillor Lando kind of referenced, the Slido. So, any of the questions and answers for tonight's videos will be posted on or linked on our website. So, some of those questions that we didn't get to, we will be trying to work through those. But um, I did get a note from the man behind the curtain there saying that we'll be redirecting the site on our website as well. We have 96 questions on Slido. So anyone who asks, has asked on Slido, we really appreciate it and we will answer every question. Um, just a quick question. You, if I remember correctly, back when the council adopted the adjudication method, it was so that they could sort of get effectively sort of find people who were, you know, infracting, um, who might not be in town because you could leave them or you could mail them and something like that. So under this new Bill 35 legislation, part of it is that there is the capacity to give uh, higher fines, but if they can't be mailed out to people who aren't in town, are we are we actually benefiting from that at all? Well, because we adopted that for a reason. Option for them to change the adjudication funds. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> it's a great point. Honestly, it is something that we have uh, I, I know I've, I've brought it up there in council and it is something we have talked about as well is and actually we have raised this with the province as well it is something a lot of municipalities do rely on the adjudication system there are numerous municipalities that you have used it it came into place in 2003 and there are quite a few that do use it we are really hoping that the province does take a look at it because yes that is one of the really important tools that we all use to try to gain compliance on some of those uh, out-of-town owners as we did kind of talk about earlier, we will be reviewing our uh, municipal ticketing information bylaw as well for some of those increased fines as it has stepped up to the 3000 per offense. But I mean, that doesn't mean that uh, we won't still be using the adjudication system. At the end of the day, we will be, it, it's not one or the other. It is gonna be, we're, we're gonna be using whichever system best suits the needs of that specific enforcement method. Everyone flood the attorney general's inbox and say increase fines and adjudication bylaws. Then that gives us the ability to do it. Uh, not to put you on the spot too much, but um, roughly like how, what's the proportion of, um, of the MTI uh, tickets that get handed out versus the adjudication? I know it only came in December, you said. Um, yeah. Roughly right now, like, what's, like what does it work out to? I honestly don't have those exact numbers. Um, it is something that we have utilized for our parking enforcement as well. Um, obviously that was one of the challenges with municipal ticketing and servicing as well. So uh, we have been utilizing it for uh, parking enforcement as well as leading up to it, our officers were reviewing which offenses would be better suited to be uh, enforced under that uh, adjudication system versus municipal ticketing. But we are utilizing the, uh, the bylaw notices a little bit more at this point because it is one of those tools that we do need for parking enforcement and short-term rental enforcement. So with that, we just want to say thank you to everyone for taking the time to come out today. We kept you a little bit longer. We really appreciate everyone coming out. Please come out whenever we have these public info sessions. We really want to provide as much objective information as we can. So thank you to everyone for taking the time out of their evenings. And, and thank you to Jay behind the scenes for doing an absolutely amazing job and Jen at the front for welcoming everyone. Very, very good stuff.